just get get started, talk through what what the objective is, the design challenge, and then we'll you know party on. Um, this one's going to be an interesting one. I think there was a lot of there was a lot of feedback from uh, folks on the depth anything uh, control nut and kind of the the surprise of things that you could do with that in just you know general uh, generations. And so today we're going to level it up a bit. Um, for those of you who are using this professionally, I think you guys are going to find uh, some really cool tips and tricks for creating workflows that will help you out and save you a lot of time as well. Um, so I'm excited to, to get started with that. Um, before we kick it off, uh, Millen, is there anything you want to say? No, just... Thanks for joining everyone. Uh, and yeah, this is, I think, going to be a really great session. Very excited for some stuff Kent is about to show off. Cool. All right. Uh, well, here we go. Um, I think today I'm going to start by just showing uh, a couple of different ways that we can uh, use this. I I am going to kind of solicit some thoughts, perspectives, and opinions. I'm also going to rely on some help here to keep an eye on the chat in case any anyone's got, because uh, I it's, there's often so much chatter, I can't really keep up as I'm going through this stuff. Um, but I am uh, definitely open to uh, people making suggestions, asking to see uh, certain things, and we'll just kind of run through the workflow. Um, so what, what we've got pulled down here are a couple of um, open models of uh, you know, basically 3D models that people have created in Blender. And what I did with this was created a, a viewport render. I did the export of the viewport and I had the object turned in basically two orientations, right? So I've got a um, kind of an archway here that is uh, standing up and then kind of the top down of that. And, you know, when we think about textures, materials, and kind of using 3D objects and figuring out how to use stable diffusion on this. One, one, you know, functionality that is key is understanding when you have an image, what can you do with that in 3D tooling? And, you know, in Blender, you have a, a number of capabilities, but the one that is really powerful here is kind of the project um, texture uh, capability, which is you can take a, a, a 2D image like this uh, throw it up over the 3D image and then kind of have that texture uh, brushed in on, on the object itself. And so if you get, you know, a really good um, base on it, you have the ability to really, you know, texture it really quickly with things like stable diffusion. Um, and, and then in a way that makes a lot of sense to that object, depending on how you prompt for it. So what today we'll, we'll kind of talk through is I'll, I'll show that workflow and I'll be looking for, uh, you know, thoughts and feedback from everybody on that as well as as we go through. Like, what what do we think this is, and what style are we trying to get out of this? Um, but then we'll walk through building this into a workflow that we can easily reuse without having to go through all of the steps that I'm about to show you for executing this task. Um, so I will open it up to everybody. What, what are some textures that we can imagine being projected onto this 3D image? What would we like to see? Chat is open. And if I have to come up with it myself, I will. Got a lot of ideas up in this old noggin of mine. Oh, you know what? I do have to share my screen first. So that, that would, be, uh, would be important. Would be important. Let's do that. Let's do that. Can we all see this? That'll help. That'll help. Um, so we've got this kind of 3D image of an arch. Uh, and we've got two different orientations. Okay, rocks and moss. Okay. That, that mossy stone is, seems to be the consensus of the, uh, the group here. Okay. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a control nut obviously, and I'm going to have that be a depth control nut. Uh, we'll take a look at what we get out of this. All right, cool. It looks pretty good. 
Um, you do have some options here as well, depending on you know how much time you want to wait around for the depth image. Most of the time, the depth anything small model is pretty good. I mean, it, it does a really good job. Um, but you can also increase the image resolution. Um, and that what that's doing is it's outputting a larger image. And so there may be some more detail in that. You can also increase that to a larger model if you have enough VRAM. I would say most people do. Um, and what can, that can do is just produce a higher fidelity uh, depth control. And sometimes that's useful, sometimes it's not needed. And so you don't really need that level of like uh, additional granularity. That's why it defaults to small because it's super efficient. Um, but I think in this case, this depth model looks really good. Uh, and so we'll leave it there and close that back down. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna do in this case is I'm actually going to go to my image to image tab and set this as the initial image. And so what we're doing here is we're setting our initial color uh, in this kind of the, the regions of this image. And we're going to probably use a really high denoising strength. Um, I'm going to start out at 0.95. And this is so high as to beg the question, why are we even using image to image at all, right? So it's, you're almost ignoring all of the color and content of that image. And the answer is because we, we want to ignore most of the color information, but what we're doing here with image to image is we're actually feeding in and, and shaping the noise that this process is going to be uh, run on and augmenting it so that things are a little bit darker around our kind of structure here to give kind of that background look. And all of the regions that are light in this kind of blender export, they are going to be where the subject is presented. And we have a high enough denoising strength that it's gonna kind of ignore all the color there. It's got a lot of denoising steps to run through and create more content. Um, and so we're kind of using both image to image and control net to really hone in on, we're keeping the structure the same, we're augmenting it so that there's more of the background and we kind of have some control over the, the area that there is content. And we're also giving enough, uh, you know, um, we're not giving enough de denoising steps to get to a resulting image that matches our prompt. So now we have to figure out how we're going to prompt this. And, uh, you know, I, would say normally I've got like, you know, a little uh, list of prompt words that, you know, make sense for the, the task at hand. Um, but in this case, we're going to kind of work together to come up with something that works for this pipeline. And, and I think it's important to go through this process and demonstrate that it's not just like, ah, oh, you know, perfect every single time the moment we come up with something. Because what you're typically doing in a professional context using these tools is you're figuring out what what is something that i can do repeatedly without having to think about it every single time to get this type of process done and so you kind of iron out that workflow and that's when you take it and move it into the workflows tab when you take kind of the experimentation that you've done and you create something that you can really easily pull back in and automate. Um, so I, I do see one question coming in on uh, clarifying the process for using an image and control net that is not the same size as your generation image size. So I'm going to ask for some clarification on that question. Um, are you specifically saying if I use a control net image that's like very large, or are you saying if I use a control net image in this case that has a 1024 image resolution. Yeah. Uh, the image output is 1024 by 1024, but the control net image is not. Um, in this case, I'm not going to actually generate at 1024 by 1024. So that's, that's the key. If I, if I were, <laughs> if I were to use 1024 by 1024, what would end up happening is this control net is set to resize. Um, so this is one of the advanced options underneath that advanced panel and the resize mode uh, has you have a couple of options on the the resize mode but this as the tooltip shows 
is how the control net image is going to be fit into the image output. The default is resize. So we're gonna take this long image and we're gonna squeeze it to fit 1024 by 1024. That may be okay if you are okay with significant distortions or if the image is pretty close to square and you just kind of want the general shape. Uh, if you were to not want that, you would need to change that to something like crop or fill. Now, I will say if you choose crop or fill, uh, you don't really have as much control over which part of the image it's cropping to. That's one of the feature enhancements that is on the list of uh, things that we'd like, love to add at some point is ability to kind of select that um, region of the, the crop. But as of right now, you've got crop fill and you know, really those are gonna be centered and it's just gonna kind of crop everything out or fill the image to fit the size of, if that's, um, if it's smaller, for example, than, um, than what you have selected. Typically, if you're, if you're not intending to do the whole image as a control, I, I think the best way to control that right now is to just you know, make sure that you're resizing and cropping that image outside of invoke before you pull it in so that you can actually like get that fit to the right size that you um that you want um for now though we are going to do resize but now, now we actually have to get our output to match the aspect ratio of uh our image now this is where things get you know fun because our input image here is a 1920 by 1080 you know i took this on a big screen and so now i'm going to be generating using a 1920 by 1080 uh, aspect ratio. So I, I essentially just want to match that aspect ratio. And, and there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, the way that, you know, typically you'd do that is just locking the aspect ratio and then kind of moving that around. I'll show you kind of one trick that, that you can do if you ever get into like the mechanics of, I, I'm trying to get somewhere close to this, but I need to, to fiddle around. You know, you can manually go up to something like that. So in this case, I'll go 1920 by 1088. I'll lock that. And then I'm just going to bring that down, right? Because again, we don't want to necessarily generate at that large size with the model that wasn't trained on it. We want to pull that back down to something like, you know, around the Excel model in this case, or if you're using SD 1.5, you're going to want to bring that down even further so, so that it's around that kind of like 500 to 700 pixel on each dimension uh, size. That just makes sure that the image generation process doesn't go crazy and kind of lose its mind. Um, the models are trained very, very much on these specific size images. And so if you go above the, the training size, what you typically get, if you haven't already seen this, you're lucky, but you get like multiple heads and arms. It's just, it's a nightmare. Um, a truly, truly uh, terrible, terrible nightmare. Um, and we don't want that. So we're going to focus on generating at the right size for the model. So in this case, we've got our size set. Uh, we've got our model, our control adapter set. We're all good there. Um, if I if I wanted to, we could throw in like an IP adapter and have that do the texturing for us. That might be a fun idea. I just literally had it though, so I don't have any textures. Maybe we'll try that idea later. Um, so for now, we got to come up with a prompt for this. So I'm going to do a, we'll try, you know, 3D Unreal Engine render. This Unreal Engine is obviously the best engine. It looks the best. Um, and we are going to have, I'll put in the term diffuse map just because I think that typically um, helps map it to kind of like the, the 3D uh, rendering space. And we'll go with um, Moss and the stone archway uh, depth dynamic lighting. Um, and you know what? We're just going to see what we get. And if we need to iterate from there, we'll, we'll take it one step at a time. We don't want to get too crazy here trying to perfect the prompt. And we don't know that we need to do any more than what we've already done. I'm going to check one more time to make sure I've got everything squared away. It all looks good to me. So we're going to send that one off. Um, and here we are generating our image. Uh, may not have had the model loaded, so we will wait a second for the model to get loaded in and we'll get started. Um, I'll keep an eye on uh, some questions here so I don't forget. Uh, so the fill would work better. 
for example, if you had a picture frame and wanted to fill the contents of it with control net or frame. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's what you're asking. Uh, fill is going to be something like if you take a small image and try to make it your desktop background, right? You can kind of like fill the space with the image. Um, so it's, it's imperfect. Okay. This one's interesting. Uh, so we definitely got the shape of our archway. I would argue that there's a little bit of extra background stuff there that might be uh, a little bit annoying. Although if you took this into blender and projected it, it would work fine, right? Because all of it's in the right spot. So this isn't necessarily bad. And if we look at, um, let's just open this in a new tab. If we look at this, I think there's some pretty good stuff on this. Like I don't hate the texture on this at all. It's more, more so just like there's some extra stuff in the background. Don't think it would really get in the way of, of using this in Blender, but you know, maybe we want to clean that up. Um, so we might try decreasing our denoising strength. Yeah. You can mask it out. If you, if you needed to mask it out, you can mask it out. Like again, this is useful still, but we're trying to figure out again, what is a workflow that we want to repeat? And so Right now we're, we're in this mindset, not of, I'm trying to get one specific image. Instead, we're thinking about what is the process that I'm going through that if I were to standardize, standardize this and repeat it over and over again, like how would I make this useful to myself, right? And so in this case, you know, what, what I'm thinking about is like this part of the prompt, um, Maybe that's like a, a standard thing that gets appended. And in my workflow, I'm only ever typing in what I specifically need to see. Everything else is done in the workflow itself. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but that's that's kind of like where uh, things get a little fun. Uh, Vic had this uh, good suggestion, which was passing the depth map as the initial image for some neat results. So. I'm, I'm going to do that. I think that's a great suggestion. I hit the save control image button there. Um, it's there now. So we pass that in There's our control image. And so we've got a little bit starker of a contrast on the background. Uh, <laughs> he said, don't he said only quote him if it works. Um, it's, it, it, I think it will. I think it will work. I think this is a good idea but it's got a stronger contrast with the background. And, and again, you can control this in Blender. I, did, I just exported like um, a gray background in Blender, but you could you know, make this a green screen background in Blender or something like that. And you have a starker contrast. And that way, when you get um, you know, the, the resulting image, it's got that stark contrast there. Really what we're trying to do is make sure that the noise is shaped in such a way that we don't get the types of artifacts where it's kind of like muddled and, and looks like one big block of things. We want things kind of floating in abstract space. So I like this idea of using this, uh, the depth image as the initial image input. And if that works, what's really cool about our workflow is that we can automate that process. We can automate that discovery and build that into the pipeline. So that gets really cool. So let's try this again um, and we'll see if that works for us. Oh, look at that. Whew. Is that not looking good? All right. We're going to switch to our other tab here to look at that. Wow. How about that? Come on. It's pretty awesome, right? Like that just really works well. Um, and we can take that right into Blender. <laughs> Safely quote me now. Okay, Vic, this is, this is Vic's idea. This is really, really clean, right? And now we have um, some things that we can build off of. And I think, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody earlier today and I think they, they had this realization because they're deploying this on the team and they said something to the effect of, um, this is a tool in the artist's toolkit, right? This isn't the, the thing that replaces the artist. It's the, the tool in their toolkit that helps with the process. This is probably not going to ship, right? This, this asset as is needs a little bit of work. It's going to have to go in. You're going to have to touch it up to make it kind of higher quality. But this is a really good start, right? This is a really, really good place to work with. 
And again, you're kind of going to want to make sure that the, the thing you're pulling out of Blender is really, um, you know, shaped in the right way so you can project everything that you, you need to and you don't have like a lot of empty gaps. But this is like a good just mental model for how you can project new content using Stable Diffusion and then pass that over into tools like Blender. So uh, we've got one down and we like this workflow, but we want to test it now on a different asset. So we're going to take a character now. We're going to pass that in to our SDXL depth control adapter. And we'll save that control image. Or, yeah, and I see you up there. Come through. There we go. All right, so we've got this guy. Um, we'll pull him over. Now that we're kind of repeating this workflow here, uh, we're going to leave everything else there. And what, now that we've got our mossy stone archway, what kind of individual here are we creating? Like what, what is the description of our character? Um, and yes, the question was, uh, you'd pull that into Blender and project the image onto 3, 3D model. Yes, that is what would help you get that kind of like base texture. And it, it will just kind of like fit right over the, the image because we've controlled it with the depth uh, control net. So it's going to kind of like mesh itself into that 3D uh, object. Okay, so we've got a <laughs> a librarian, a uh, historian. I wonder what kind of character we're uh, thinking of here. Um, so we've got a uh, adventurous librarian. Uh, trying to think of some other. He's got a leather jacket, uh, denim jeans, and... Uh, See, are we going to get somebody that looks good with this? Uh, he might be looking kind of CGI with this prompt. Um, we'll go with a... I'm going to try an idea here. I'm going to try an idea here. Ink and watercolor style. Okay, this is it's maybe a little bit... Um, maybe a little strange, but I'm, like, I'm trying to like get a certain look that maybe isn't just typical 3D rendering. I want kind of one of those stylized looks. Typically, if you're doing this in Blender, what you would do is, is kind of create shaders and stuff like that that give you all of these effects. Um, if you haven't seen kind of like the how-tos um, or how it was made for uh, the most recent Spider-Man movie, they have done some really just magnificent work with shaders to create a lot of cool effects. Um, and that's kind of like how they get that style. But this is a good kind of way to push push our, our texture into a specific direction. So we'll see what we get. Okay. I think it gave him uh, a denim jacket on the backside as well. And it was, I gave it a, I gave us a woman as well. So maybe we need to put masculine, but you know, if we wanted, if we wanted this, it'd be great. Um, but we've got to drive some consistency here on the front and back view. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in front and back view as part of the prompt, just so that it knows, like we're looking at this kind of front and back, um, type look. Um, we'll also, since we're, uh, you know what, you know what it is, I think, um, you know, one, one thing not to, to, not to forget is that these models, these AI models are relatively biased, right? They just kind of are based on the data that is out there in, in, in the culture, right? And so it assumes that librarians are women. And I think that's, you know, not fair because I like books too. And I think uh, we want to kind of push this in the right direction. There is some work being done to improve the bias in the models. Um, I think Runway pushed out a video where they synthetically created a lot of uh, people in specific job descriptions and kind of like trained that back into the model so that it had a broader diversity of um, perspectives on like what was possible. But another way that you can do this as an artist, I mean, I, I think ultimately the artist is always the one responsible for what's coming out of these models and making sure that we've got, you know, what we want to see. Let's put masculine in there. So we kind of are pushing that um, in a certain direction. We'll do masculine man. And we'll give this another shot. 
and see if we can get that consistency on the front and the back of our jacket. Um, while that's generating, Vic had another neat tip around how colors affect noise. Um, with as long as values are in the gray zone, noise generated uh, by stable diffusion will be very close to what you draw. So you can use gray colors to help guide some of the noise. All right, so our front and back views kind of pushing us into only back views now. And we're trying to really get this to do both. Let's take a look at upping this to lar the large depth anything model. Um, so we can really see if we can get some of that detail on like the face area. But what we might also consider doing is maybe soft edge, adding in a second control net to really make sure that we're able to capture some of the details uh, of our render. And this is all good information for us as we think about uh, the process, because we want this to be repeatable. We want this to be as consistent as possible when we recreate this in our workflow. Um, I actually think I like the, I like the base one better. And I think we're going to go with that. Um, so what we'll do is we'll add another control net and we'll do maybe our soft edge could do canny as well, but, um, let's go back to our base asset here. So we've got soft edge and see what the soft edge is doing is really giving a little bit more of the specific details because the depth has kind of the 3D space, but we want some of these things that will guide the diffusion process for facial features and front of jacket versus back of shoulders. Those things get kind of pulled into the diffusion process and it's like, oh, okay, that's more of a back, that's more of a, a front. Whereas when, it, when you're doing kind of just the depth model, it can kind of get confused here. What we may do is we may only do that for the first like 55% or 60% because that's where we really need it to guide the um, this is a front, this is a back. And then we still have all of that freedom on the back end for some of the details that it might have. So we'll go ahead and try this one. Do you touch on how you decide on what that first control net you're going to start using is, whether that's like a depth or canny? How do you normally decide which one you're going to go for first? I yeah, I mean, I think in in the context of the use case, we're we're asking ourselves what type of control do we need with Blender, for example. We very much want man. We still we still are struggling here. Um, we very much want depth in space, um, so we're looking for uh, control around that three D object. And this this hideous, it's like created the back of his head, but it's uh, using the, the control on the front. Um, let's let's give this another shot. Uh, and I'll I'll kind of continue to talk while while we're doing that. Um, so in this case, we we know we need the depth as a base. Um, what we are adding into that is like what additional details do we need to like augment the control to really get the the things that we're looking for. So typically if you're doing a sketch. You're going to start with something like canny or soft edge, depending on like how much um, control you want to specifically give it. And you're really focusing on 2D because uh, you're making like an image and you're just kind of like trying to have the, the bounds of that structure uh, controlled with, with control net. With depth, A, you need an input that has really clear depth information in it, right? You need an input that it can tell in 3D space where things are. And that's somewhat harder with a sketch, although you can get it if you do enough shading and kind of really focus on that. Um, so it, it really is kind of like, what, what data do we have to work with and what is the output we're trying to get? That helps inform uh, what we're doing there. You can obviously also do an open pose if you have uh, either good pose data or you go create some in like a, an open pose editor of some sort. And those can help with things like this. Although even then it's not, it's not perfect. Um, so let's try switching to canny here and see if we can get this to um, pick up on these lines. 
So it is really, it's really struggling on this. And it might be the prompt. I might need to, um, I need to help give it some guidance on the prompt. One thing that SDXL is lacking is a good embedding for this type of, um, oh, there we go. We got it. We got there eventually. We got there. All in iterative process, right? It is, it is. And that's kind of part of the part of the thing. So now we've got like our adventurous librarian. We've got like him in 3D. We can take this out into Blender and we can use that as a projection, right? And we can kind of get a lot of that uh, starter texture for that thing. Um, so we'll we'll call that a win and and focus on building out the workflow now because that is going to take a little bit of time. Um, so I'll go ahead and make sure that I keep an eye on questions as they come in. But we're going to take down some notes on this tab, right? Um, we are we've got our prompts, we've got our um, settings, we've got controls that we need to keep an eye on. We're using image to image, like we're we're noting all of the things that we're going to need to go recreate in our workflow editor. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a new workflow. And we are going to start from scratch. I'm just going to get the whole thing from scratch. Uh, typically, what I'd recommend doing is opening up the library and using one of the default workflows as a starting point, just so that you don't have to do it all uh, from scratch. Uh, and maybe that's probably what I should do. I, you know, I think the idea of going through it uh, step by step is is exciting, but maybe what we'll we'll do is just focus that on that in a getting started video for the basics on workflows and we'll show how things can um be connected when you're getting started from the very 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 beginning but for now let's just use one of the default workflows so i'll do a default sdxl text to image uh and in our default prompt we got super cute tiger cub because what who wouldn't want a picture of that we'll take all that stuff out um and we're also going to delete all of the linear view um, boxes because we're going to manually control those and we're going to augment this um, the way we need it to work. So first thing I'll just add is our models. Um, we'll get those set in and then we need to figure out what we need to add. So we need to add control nets. Uh, so I'm going to start reorganizing some things. Now when you get into the workflow tab, um, it is it is like a place to get work done and you very much want to understand just like on the unified canvas it's really helpful to understand all of the tools that are available to you right so if you are using the unified canvas and you're not using the hotkeys you're doing it wrong because the hotkeys will save you a ton of time if you're in the workflow system you want to make sure that you understand how to manipulate like things in groups and use a lot of the stuff here so we'll touch on a couple of quick kind of tips and tricks for the workflows and then we'll get started breaking this down so anytime i want to select multiple nodes at the same time i'm holding down shift and i'm dragging to select multiple nodes that allows me to select them in a group and then i can kind of move them around together connections don't break the spaghetti follows me wherever i go uh, and then i can kind of like separate things out so that I can use them. If I want to copy multiple selected nodes, I can do control C and then control V and it will create a new group with those. So this is a really good way of duplicating parts of the uh, workflow when you're doing repetitive steps. Uh, you can delete, hit the delete key to delete those. Now, when I'm adding new nodes, you can go through and hit the space bar and type in the name of the node you wanna add or you can drag anything that you need an input for. And actually, let me do this. Let's do the control one here. You can drag that out and it will show you the possible options that you can add for that input. So in this case, I'm bringing out control. It's brought three options that work and are valid for that input. I'm going to do a collect because I need to have multiple uh, control nets uh, applied. And now we'll just kind of go through the process of creating our uh, control nets. So we'll do control nets and I'll copy and paste that because we're going to do two control nets here. And then we are going to pull out our processor. We need to have a depth anything processor. Do 
base 1024. And then we need to do our canny processor because we decided we'd like canny more on that one. And then this will be our canny model. This will be our depth model. I know I'm moving like a mile a minute, so if I need to slow down, just let me know. Basically, all I'm doing right now, is just kind of go step by step. When you're using control nets, you are passing in an image. It is getting pre-processed. It's getting turned into the input for the control net, and then it is previewing that. So we're seeing that process of, of image goes in, gets pre-processed, and pre-processed image is displayed. And then we're taking that pre-processed image and running it through a control net model. Each control net model is specifically trained on a certain type of input images. Uh, so it's, it's, it's basically like, um, if you think about what these control net models have, have gone through in their training and their kind of studies, their, their university, if you will, um, they have been trained on when I give you this like canny image, this pre-processed image, this is the, the shape of that image that it should come out the other side. Like it's basically gone through a training exercise where it looked at before and after pictures that map together. So there's like a hundred thousand, let's say pairs of canny images and the resulting image that they would generate. Most of the time, this is created by taking the resulting image and then generating the canny. And so it's kind of linking these all together. It's learning the relationship between the canny edges and the resulting output. And then the model is able to replicate that with new canny images. And so all it's been trained on is I take a canny image and I help make the resulting image match that canny map. So if I pick the control net model for canny, I can pass it any image, but if it's not a canny map, it's not going to know what to do with it. And it's just going to kind of fumble around. But if I pass it a canny map, it knows what to do. Similarly, with the depth control net, it's been trained on depth maps. And, and specifically, I believe that the only depth maps that work are the black and white uh, variants of this. There are some uh, depth models that generate like very bright heat map looking stuff. And it's very cool, but is ultimately not um, going to be useful for the depth models because they're all trained on these kind of black and white images uh, where black is in the background and white is in foreground. So in this case, we have created a depth anything processor. We're taking the image and connecting that out. The way that the workflow process works is we are going left to right, typically, um, on input to output. And so everything that happens to the left is going to get processed first. It's going to go through the processor. It's going to take an image. It's going to put that to the output, uh, run that through the control net process, and pump that into the denoising latent so that it's all tagged and ready to go to run the denoising process. So we've got our control nets mapped. Now we need to uh, go in and add in our latents, right? So we need to, uh, let, me, let me take a step back here. I want to make sure I'm explaining this. For image to image, what's happening is your image, your initial image, is getting turned into latents. And then noise is added in on top of that for the denoising process. What that means is we need to make sure that the image and the noise are the same size. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab our uh, noise and random seed nodes. These are the ones that come with the default um, workflow. And we're going to run through this real quick. We're going to generate a random seed. So every single time this generates, it's going to be a new image. It's not a fixed seed. But now we need to figure out how to get this width and height to be dynamic because we're going to pass in an image. So what we want to do is add an image primitive node. And what I'm going to do is um, we'll rename this our um, Blender image. I'll even rename the node Blender Image Input. And then I'm going to right click that or new feature that should be released soon. You've got a plus button to add to the linear view. Wow, features. 
Um, so you add that in and that becomes one of your standardized inputs that you're always going to pass in. Now, what can we automate so that we don't have to configure things or update settings anytime that we do this? Well, we can automate the size of our noise, right? So we take our noise and pass the width and height and connect those together. Um, that means that if I bring in a big image, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through this process because this is kind of like the debugging process. If I bring in a really large image, this is gonna be an issue, right? Because it's gonna try to generate a really large um, output. So this one may not work. We may need to fiddle with this a little bit. So uh, probably should have thought about this beforehand so that I could think about all the notes that I'm going to need and the map that I'm going to do. But we're going to do this live because we've got a little bit of time. We're going to go through the process of what exactly you would need to do to figure this out. So in order for this to be completely future-proof and take any input that any user gives us, even if it's like massively way too big uh, and, and, and that would be an issue if we tried to generate that size, we need to do some math, right? And the math that we're gonna do is we're gonna take the width and height and make it an ideal size. Uh, luckily, luckily, we have the ideal size node here. Uh, so I don't actually have to do this math. I'm really grateful for our contributors who helped make this node possible. I think this is JP Photo's ideal size node that he contributed to the project. And basically this does the math for us. Whew. I thought I was gonna have to do math live and then I remembered this thing existed. Okay, so we've got the ideal size node. And what this does is it calculates the ideal size for the generation based on the model weights. So what you pass in is you pass in the unit. We've got a SDXL model basically going to say, oh, SDXL models, they need the 1024 by 1024 size or some approximation of that. And now it's just going to automatically update that for us. Every time we generate uh, with this workflow, it's going to take the image. It's going to be like, if you've got that size image, this is the ideal size for that, right? So now we're safe there. We've got math and we can pass that through the ideal size node directly into our noise node. And now we're good to go. Um, so now we've got our prompts, our model, our noise. We need to get our latents. And the latents are the, uh, these are the mathematical, like mathematical representations of your image so that the model can take those in. So what that means is we need to turn our image input into latents. Uh, so we're going to do image to latents. This uses the VAE to convert our image into latents so that we can then pass that into the denoising process. Uh, so we'll turn pass that through and now we've got the latents. So now we're doing an image to image generation with this uh, workflow. And now we need to make sure that this image also gets passed in to our depth anything processor. Now, what I'm recognizing though, is what we learned in our workflows that we actually don't want this image to be our latents, right? Um, we don't want that because the, we, we decided we didn't like, uh, we, we, we wanted the actual depth anything processor to serve as our, as our latents image. So what we're gonna do is connect these down to our processors. So we've got um, our depth anything and canny processor down here that we need in image inputs for. So that's gonna go down there. Uh, maybe we can even bring our um, noise nodes down to join the party in this. And what we're gonna do is once we've done our depth anything process, we're going to take this image and we will pull that up to this image to latents node. So this is going to control our latents. I don't know, where do I want that to live? I like to, I like to organize things so that it's a little bit clean in my, my mind, but I recognize things have just kind of gotten all shifted around. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this all down here. We'll put our image to latents right here. And so this is kind of like all the image stuff and junk. We've got our prompt box and our um, model stuff here. And then we've got the denoising process on the back end. Uh, we'll want to go through and tweak some stuff in here. Well, actually, all of that's pretty fine. I'll just leave that as is. But we do need to expose a couple of things to make this useful for us. So uh, we probably want our prompts. Uh, we use the button. Excuse my right clicks. Give me some, some fits here. Um, do I want the model? Maybe I, I, I personally, if I were making this for myself, um, I usually just kind of have one model per purpose. Like if it's for a specific purpose, I know the model that I'm going to use. Um, if I were to add a Laura to this, Effectively, what you'd want to do is before this hits the denoising latent node, you'd have a Laura, which you would need to pass in all of these like other things. And basically, what a Laura does is the Laura is taking the model. And if you watch the recent getting started video on models and concepts, it explains this this kind of concept of what a Laura is but it's kind of like a, a layer that sits on top of the model and gets patched in. It's turning all of the weights, which are just kind of the mathematical representation of different words and stuff inside of the model. It's layering in an extra set of uh, concepts inside of the model. And so when you're using a workflow and, and kind of going through this process uh, to, to utilize it, you take the model you pass it through the LoRa node and the LoRa node's responsible for layering that in and it outputs an entirely new full set of model weights that has the new stuff patched in. If you have multiple LoRa's, you basically just need to kind of treat this like a factory line. It goes through LoRa 1, outputs itself into LoRa 2, outputs itself into the, you know, denoise latency node and that's where it goes off and does all all the magic. Now, when you do use a LoRa, you're going to want to make sure that you pass that into your prompt fields as well, because um, it, it outputs the clips, uh, which are the, the text encoders. Um, so I won't do that now just because it's going to be a lot of fiddling. But we'll go through and um, actually finish out this workflow and give it a go um, with one of our inputs. Um, so we are going to. What I want to do is do a string join. And I'm actually going to take this positive prompt away. I'll uh, say this is the concatenated prompt. And this is going to be my positive prompt. And I will have a controlled 3D texturing style. Uh, and this is where we'll just copy out that kind of um, depth dynamic lighting, lighting piece and bake that directly into the workflow so that every time I use this, it's passing that in. Then all I really need to do is have my positive prompt here be what is the blender object that I've passed in or the, the kind of texture that I want on top of that. Um, and I'll just keep our negative prompt unexposed. It's pretty basic as well. Um, although we could expose that just to make that easier for folks. Um, anything I'm forgetting? I don't think so. I think this thing's pretty good to go. Let's double check. Blender image is missing an input. That's the only reason I can't start. So I just need to put an image. Um, so we'll go ahead and save this workflow as a Blender image processing. And now we're saved and we're ready to kick this thing off. Uh, so I'm going to take my assets. I'm going to pass in the stone arch. Um, we've already got the depth dynamic lighting diffuse map 3D Unreal Engine render. It is already taking the depth anything. So we go back to our workflow and we um, remix this guy so we can see all the settings. Um, it's there. We. I think have everything that we need. Oh, it's good that I went back to check on this. 
the denoising strength that we landed on was 0.9. And we need to have that highlighted in here as well. Uh, so we need the denoising start here to be 0.1. Uh, so you can think of denoising strength as kind of the part of the process that you are skipping. It's the, the inverse of, um, I don't want to confuse people here, so I'm going to try to figure out how to like say this the simplest way. A denoising strength of 0.9 means you're starting at the 10% line of the denoising process and finishing that out. So that's that's kind of like 90% of the strength of denoising is starting a little bit later. If you wanted point, uh, a 30% denoising strength, we would change the denoising start to 0.7. We're starting later and later in the process, which means there's less noise added into the image and there's more of the original image left. In this case, we, we landed at 0.9, so we're going to continue using that. And give this a shot. Um, was, was there any words that we wanted to try with this new new arch style? And maybe maybe what we'll also do, uh, just because this is going to be a um, workflow that we want to repeat, uh, I'll add a save image node and set this to my textures. Um, board so that we've got that going to the right board every single time. Uh, metal arch. Okay. Um, I think it's going to look maybe a little bit weird, but we'll do a bronze arch. Um, post apocalyptic. We really like that, don't we? Okay, we'll do post apocalyptic. Uh, rusted. I don't think bronze rusts, but well, you know, stable diffusion is not going you know, to correct us. Um, okay, we'll uh, we'll give that a shot. We'll see what we get. Uh, one thing that you can do if you want to kind of get a sneak peek uh, is you can add a current image node in, and that will just show whatever you currently have selected as a preview. Uh, kind of gives us a little preview box, and we will uh, go ahead and run this. You can actually watch the nodes execute as well as it's going through. Oh, except they've got an error. Let's see what my error is. Uh, noise and latent shape are not the same size. Okay. So something. Aha. Okay. I got this. We got to make our depth. In, we had to do the resizing for our depth anything processor, right? Because we, we created that. Um, that output, when we now need to make sure that it maps to our noise. Uh, so we are going to take the image here that comes out of the depth anything process, and we are going to run it through uh, a resizing. Yeah, so we'll take this resize image. And we need the resize of that to be the size of our ideal size that is coming out. And I know that I'm going very quickly here. You know I'm going very quickly. I just want to make sure that we get this thing generating a picture before we leave. So it is resizing the image for us. It's replicating that resize functionality we talked about earlier. And then we are connecting this up into our uh, just the image to latent code right here, down at the bottom. Okay. Boop. All right. So now we'll tuck this away. Uh, we'll make this somewhere like right here. So it's a little bit clean. So it's resizing itself. It's popping into image to latent. It's coming up, We're running through the process, and then we have it. So this is this is the part of the workflow process is working through these little little quirks. Uh, so now we're effectively going through the denoising process. It is uh, generating our bronze arch po post-apocalyptic rusted uh, texture. And I'm going to see that output here momentarily. Wow, look, it looks like a piece of bronze. It looks like a piece of metal. Um, I don't think that I would use this because I don't think it's like, it doesn't look like an arch, but it is metal. It's like a metal... It's shaped like metal, looks like a uh, maybe a bronze cast of what an arch might look like to it. Um, 
but it's pretty good. You know, it's pretty good. We'll take it. We'll take it. Um, now, if we wanted to, we could use this as the Blender image as well and have some real fun with it and kind of feed this back into itself and in perpetuity into eternity. But we're not going to do that. Um, one last thing that we'll touch on, this is going to be like the three minute, uh, you know, super fun, do it, do it real quick um, type thing. Uh, we'll go to our text to image tab. We're, we're done with the workflow. So we're, we'll go back to the workflow. We're going to save the workflow and we're done with it. This is our workflow. Now we can, um, you know, reset our image. We can update this and reuse this. Our workflow is done. Um, I'll go ahead and download this and share it out as well. So everybody can have it who joined the session today. Um, and if you're watching after the fact and want the, um, want the workflow, leave a comment or something and I'll get it to you. Um, but we're going to go through and do the other texturing trick, which is seamless tiling. Now I will say, um, I prefer SD 1.5 for seamless. Uh, it seems to work better for the implementation that we have on seamless tiling. Um, but I will do like just a real quick one, uh, flower pattern, uh, roses and or it's uh, texture pack uh, pattern. I'm just using whatever word I can prompt for it. I've got the seamless tiling toggles set on. This is set at 512 by 512, and we'll generate this one. Uh, it'll load that model up quickly and then run through that. Um, and then this is just kind of one of those like pattern textures that you can use. Um, Super cute, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the thing that I always do just to double check, there's a quick website uh, that does a seamless texture checker. Not that guy. We'll go in, open up our texture and paste it in. And wow, look at that, we've got a new pattern. Isn't that, isn't that great? You can go put, put this on a, on a purse or something and sell it for $100,000. Um, it's super easy, super quick to create seamless tiles and you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Um, you can obviously create, you know, materials, textures for video games as well. It's not just like patterns. You can do like brick or stone and then you've got that in a tileable way uh, for use in like a video game or any other 3D modeling. Um, that stuff's super cool um, and very useful. And that's just the uh, seamless tiling X and Y axis on the left hand side. Um, all right, we are at time. We did it. We nailed it. We created the workflow. We figured it out. We did you know both types of, of inputs. A lot of fun. Um, appreciate everyone's questions and everyone participating. There was a lot of good chatter. Um, I will drop the workflow in um, momentarily so that you can have that and. Yeah, thanks for joining.